We are the AI Institute and our mission is to deploy AI in a responsible way. It's absolutely everywhere. Whether we know it or not, we're using it all the time. AI Institute is the largest AI organization in Australia. This institute is wonderfully interdisciplinary in a way that we involve every single faculty to get together and work together on these artificial intelligence projects and kind of share our expertise. So me coming from architecture, we can bring problems of, of data, data bias, ethics from a built environment sector into the AI Institute. And so those ethical considerations, which brings in people from humanities disciplines to make sure that when we do AI, that it doesn't have bias discriminating against other people right. because of the training data and so forth. Um, applying deep learning techniques to electronic medical records from general practice to try to predict well in advance whether someone is at high risk of cardiovascular disease. The goal of the Institute, first and foremost, is research excellence, including fostering multidisciplinary AI research. Also in our mission is to encourage the public dialogue about the responsible use of AI. And to provide a front door for external organisations to connect with our world-class AI research. And the final goal of the Institute is to drive the impact of that research into the real world. Join us, engage with us, look at the events we're organising. To learn more about us, just look at unsw.ai. unsw.ai. <laughs> okay, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Lyria um, Bennett Moses, and I am the um, director of the UNSW Allen's Hub for Technology, Law and Innovation and a member of the UNSW AI Institute, which is very kindly hosting this event. I'm delighted to introduce Roger. Roger will give you more information about himself in a second. Um, but short note is that he's been saying interesting things for quite a while now um, about a range of things, including about um, so-called artificial intelligence. So Roger, welcome and thank you. Thank you very much, Lirio. Uh, good morning, everybody. And I've got to work out where I stand. I hope you can hear me. Look, sorry about this. We, we aren't able to duplicate these slides and they're slightly small in this, in this context. And the bad news is that they're a lot more interesting than my speech. So it would have been good if you could see them really well. Um, I want to give you a very short background on a couple of aspects of me. Firstly, about what I'm not, because I'm a serial fraud. And uh, I want to be clear that I'm not a computer scientist. I am not a lawyer. Um, in fact, I've even misrepresented myself on this line because I'm not a visiting professor in technology and law because that's not a proper title, but I am uh, in Lyria's Centre Hub, um, which, um, uh, which gives us a lot of scope and a lot of interest. I interact lots with lawyers. I do look at regulation from a broader perspective. My real background is actually information systems discipline. Um, once upon a time, uh, when I did my undergraduate and master's here, um, uh, we were up top in the Morgan Brown building, but the business schools come down in the world now and it's down here on the flat. Uh, sorry, I mean, it's physically moved uh, down onto the flat. Uh, so I'm a little bit more business uh, arena, but I spread out across a range of areas. Actually, for the last 30 years, I've earned my money as a consultant. Um, so, um, and all of my university involvements are actually secondary, dilettante, uh, and I enjoy myself, and I don't have to go for publish or perish, um, which I'm sure you will be envious of me. Um, the perspective I'm bringing, therefore, is a very applied one, a very instrumentalist one, is perhaps a better word. Um, I've been in technology for over 50, IT specifically, for over 50 years. I enjoy it. But during that period, it has got more and more powerful which is good. Uh, we thought it was a little bit risky and dangerous when I started out in the industry 55 years ago, uh, and that has escalated dramatically. So what I found with my consultancy in the latter part of my career was that my focus was always strategic and policy implications of information technologies, call it advanced, transformative, disruptive, uh, you go with the flow, whatever the fashion is, um, uh, whatever the customers think they want you to talk about. Um, so I found myself more and more looking at downsides because there were lots and lots of people looking at upsides. So this is a latter day looking at downsides and what can we do about the downside aspects. So um, there's been a sequence that I've gone through um, because AI's just been the tail end of the last 10 or 15 years of work 
in my spare time. Um, I started out with drones. I actually wanted to write a paper on the regulation of drones' impacts on behavioural privacy, because nobody had written about that. I then discovered that there weren't actually any decent papers that did the other things that you needed to, needed to have to build on in order to do that piece. And I had to do that piece, and I had to rope in somebody who actually knew something about regulation, so I did that one with Lyria. But uh, we, um, each of those um, has, uh, has attracted attention. Uh, that's got, uh, I think, the most of the, uh, most of the uh, or a good third of the, of the citations, but it, it fitted a gap. People wanted to look at these things. Throughout, my concern was drones are a great idea. There's a hell of a lot of really good applications, and boy, are there some things you can stuff up. Some of them have to do with public safety. Some of them have to do with um, uh, uh, with behavioural privacy in particular. Uh, I haven't done the fifth article because I'm not game, and that's what you, what you do uh, about them in warfare. Um, that's, that's another kill of fish entirely. I've left it alone. So it's responsible application that I was looking at. Then I had a phase where, sure, data mining has been around for literally many decades. It's changed its name. It's been presented a bit differently continually because it got a bit of a smell, so we gave it a different name. And there was the big data era, the data analytics, the data science, call it what you will. The problem with it was that people were spruiking it, but they weren't looking at the other side of things. They weren't doing effective risk assessments of the techniques that were involved. So I got stuck into those kinds of things, asking myself, how do you guide organisations to be responsible in their uses of these potentially quite powerful tools? Um, and then, of course, that dragged me by AIML to some extent uh, across into the... Whoops, missed. Uh, no, I didn't. It's just slow to react. Um, the, uh, uh, that dragged me naturally across into the question of uh, AI. And I'd never written very much on AI apart from expert systems in the uh, late 90s. I'd never worked all that much in, in this field. But it seemed to me there were a lot of things that weren't being said and drawn together. Um, and I'll show a, a couple of those, a couple of examples of that on the way through the slide set. Uh, so I, again, had to write several different things in order to get to really where I really wanted to get, which was to think about what are the alternative ways in which we can achieve regulation of AI. Um, I'm certainly not of the school of thought that says um, statute law for everything, precise, clear uh, statements by parliament. No, parliament doesn't know either. It's uh, too inflexible. It doesn't work. Um, I'm also not one of these people who believes in self-regulation uh, as a solution to everything uh, because I've seen, I've been in business too long. Um, <laughs> I say fair is uh, very good for the wolves and not very good for the sheep. Uh, but somewhere in the spectrum of regulatory capabilities and blends of different regulatory tools, there are solutions to things. So again, I had to do a whole series of things. And then I got fed up with, why was I talking about AI anyway? It's a stupid idea. So why shouldn't I be explaining what it is we should be talking about? That's that paper, and that's what I'm presenting today. So that's the background, that's the motivation, trying to achieve responsibility or achieve guidance uh, on responsibility. Now, what I'm going to do is very quickly drag you back through, uh, back down memory lane for some of you, that's for sure, on where it all began, what it originally meant, what it maybe means in a definitional sense, some instantiations of it, so that we can then think about downsides and what we do about downsides and what does it all mean then, and why is AI a stupid term? So in the beginning, um, McCarthy and a few mates said, we need some money to hold some events. It'd be great to have some assistance and some kit because uh, the early days of computing in, uh, in uh, 1955. And uh, this was the proposition and they got funding and uh, they had a really good time and there's been massive spin-offs uh, ever since. And what they were talking about was the proposition is that learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be looked at. The hypothesis is that that's Herbert Simon. I use Herbert Simon because he said some of the most outlandish things uh, about AI, and he had enormous standing for good reason because of a number of other things that he'd done. Uh, so I use quotes from him. Uh, clearly, this is not proof of anything. They're just good instances of the sorts of things people meant. I want to highlight the key words. Hello, caught up. Right, the, the key words in those quotations from another perspective. Conjecture can, in principle, to simulate human intelligence. Hypothesis that. 
That's early quotations from McCarthy and from Simon. So the starting point was an absolutely brilliant research grant request, which absolutely had to get up and get money. No two ways about it. I wish I'd, I wish I'd written a few as good as that one was. Unfortunately, things changed. And they changed fearfully quickly um, because I've got a succession of three slides stressing different words in these quotations. We shall have arrived. Is not far off arrived. Uh, here, I'm going to use Kurzweil because he's the contemporary who says absolutely stupid things and gets massively quoted because he's made a big name in one or two areas other than this one. Um, uh, will have, and his quote from 2005 uh, points to more recent times. So instead of it being a conjecture hypothesis, it's now a statement of future delivery. Hello, are you with me? Yes. So the other words in those quotes within much less than 25 years, note that that quote is from 1960. Now he repeated it and refreshed it many times, so he probably gained about 20 years by saying it again 20 years later and still giving himself 25 years. I haven't checked that, that's a joke. Uh, but um, uh, did it happen? Well, not quite like that. Within the next decade, by the end of the 2020s, says Kurzweil in 2005, um, the belief that's inherent in this is extraordinary. And the things that they are, uh, are promising us have subtly switched. We're no longer simulating human intelligence. We are now substituting. You know, imagine why the public might get upset when words like substituting suddenly arrive, duplicating. I'll come back to that one on a later slide. And intelligence indistinguishable to biological humans. Um, substantial changes in the flavor of the thing. And that substantial change has turned off a lot of people, probably including judging brother nods around the audience, a lot of you as well. So there was a bifurcation of the field. This really throws me when there's a lag like this. Uh, there's been a bifurcation for very good reasons. There is absolutely nothing wrong with playing around with the grand challenge. That's uh, if, if we don't support pure science in universities and pure humanities uh, in universities as a society, we're going to die. Um, so there's nothing wrong with this stuff, provided you don't believe that you have come out with a result that is directly applicable to our real world, provided it is brain stuff and intellectual uh, interplay. Uh, and we'll doubtless have some spin offs for the real world, but provided you don't believe in it too much, this is wonderful stuff. But a lot of us don't do that. A lot of us are instrumentalists, so we're trying to do this stuff. And the expressions used are inspiration and sometimes weak AI, and certainly narrow AI, targeted AI, call it what you will. Now, my proposition is that anybody practicing in those fields is stuck with so much language, so much culture that they can't escape carry over from this substituting the, the humans, replicating human intelligence. And that's the underlying problem that we've got to get over. So I don't think that these two have ever been able to divorce. There's still a hangover of those ideas spoiling the party, words artificial and intelligence uh, are indicative of that. Now, the second thing I want to do is to look at definition of AI. Now, this, of course, is a joke because there is no single definition of AI, no agreed definition, which makes it very hard for somebody to come in from the outside and ask you, ask you in a court or ask you as an expert witness, uh, what is it then? What do your sentences mean? You're using AI in sentences. What is that thing? So that I, as a judge, can distinguish it from other things. And it's very hard to do. Uh, the best I've been able to come up with, and that green on yellow may not show very well, I might actually read those words quickly. This is a mishmash from many sources, primarily uh, reasonably authoritative sources, trying to pluck out what are the things that are definitional, not descriptive. Um, uh, there's lots of additional attributes of lots of kinds of AI, but they're not fundamental to whether it's uh, AI or not. The first thing is that there's got to be evidence that an artifact is perceiving um, and is cognizant of relevant aspects of the environment, of its environment, maybe of ours, but certainly of its environment. The second thing that's asserted, and I'm not asserting them, I'm interpreting people who assert them, is that that artifact or the, or the software running in that artifact 
must have goals. Now that can be implemented in many different ways or reinterpreted in many different ways, because obviously with a lot of programming, it's programmed in, um, so it can have goals um, of that kind, or it can be um, possibly conscious of its own goals. It might consciously modify those goals. That's not a necessary definitional feature. It's, a, it's a, an additional possible attribute. The third thing is that it's got to formulate actions um, towards the achievement of those goals. Not necessarily well, but, uh, but it's got to formulate them. And then there is a question as to whether that's all there is or whether there's more necessary. And clearly, uh, there is a tendency in subsequent years for the marriage of robotic thinking action in the real world uh, into the AI field. Um, uh, actually, fiction got there so long ago um, uh, with the notion of an AI as distinct from AI as a generic noun. Um, uh, but it has been increasingly creeping into the expressions used by spruikers of AI as well. So. Um, now, I've had it put to me that learning should be in there somewhere, and I had to think hard about that, because obviously the word learning was in McCarthy's original key sentence, uh, but it was learning and other kinds of intelligence in, in, in that quotation. And I think the some kind of intelligence, whatever that is, uh, is central, um, and intelligence breaks down into such like things, and learning is, I think, an attribute, a further attribute, not a necessary requirement for something to be regarded as AI. But it's rubber. And when articles are written and there's surveys of 76 uh, different um, definitions from different sources, um, it's extraordinarily difficult to even map them together, um, uh, let alone to draw any firm conclusions about them. That's my pitch. That's what I'm trying to talk about when I'm, what I'm shooting at, if you like, is that. Another approach that I took was to ask myself, not so much what are examples of AI, because that's fairly well rehearsed in lots of textbooks, as where does it turn up? What are the sorts of things that AI gets embodied in? What are those artifacts? Because as you all have seen, I'm as interested in the interplay between the hardware and the software as I am in the software. And I, I went through all of those, and in that article, uh, I've got some discussion on, on each of them. Uh, but the point is, it's a lot more than just computers. And it's a lot more than just computers that can act on the world, um, uh, or the generic notion of computers that are, can act on the world. There's various instantiations of them which have different characteristics and have different impacts. They have different impacts on public perception of what AI and robotics and so forth are. And people will see little bits of the same big elephant of AI and, uh, and grab little bits of it and perceive it quite differently from one another. So I think it's important that we appreciate all of those. And I like to include cyborgs in that because we've got to think about it coming back the other way and taking biological specimens and building stuff in. Um, we've, we've, we've had um, um, artificial legs that started out as wooden beneath the knee and have moved into software running inside an artificial knee. We've, we've come a long way uh, with, with those kinds of um, endoprostheses. Um, so how far away are we from having firstly artificial intelligence inside the software in the knee um, and indeed artificial intelligence inside the um, heart monitor, uh, inside the, um, what do you call things that give you heart and impulse? Um, yes. Thank you. Um, uh, how far away are we from that? So, so cyber organization is, is well and truly alive and living and must be treated, I think, as another one of these embodiments. And for some categories of people, that will be the scariest one of all. So we've got to anticipate what kind of uh, reactions we're going to be having uh, to the kinds of things we put forward. Now, the reason I use this one is because there's a risk at this point that I'll be thinking too much like a Luddite and thinking too much like AI is bad, robotics is bad, it's too bloody dangerous, go away, we don't want you. That's, I'm trying not to do that and be that. Um, so what I've got is an example of one, which I think is really, really good. Uh, because these things, now look, these can work on mines in Western Australia, probably do. Um, uh, so remote um, uh, terrain where you don't want to send people, at least not for too long. Um, uh, now the latency from the main mine site to the subsidiary mine site isn't all that great. The latency to Mars is 20 minutes. 
So if you're trying to keep tight control on the, on, on the buggy on, on Mars, you ain't going to do it. So the amount of delegation that we are going to have to give, and they do give to these kinds of things, is very substantial. Not infinite, but very substantial. Uh, for the next 20 minutes, do whatever you think is sensible. I mean, what was the last command that, 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 that you could give the thing? Uh, and of course, we're now talking way outside the solar system. Um, uh, there's instances going on right now of, uh, of, of, of hoping the thing, uh, hoping we taught the thing enough back in 19, when did that bloody satellite go up? Um, uh, we hope that we taught it enough back then that, uh, that it's able to make some kind of sense of its world way out there beyond, uh, beyond our reach most of the time. Um, so there are some really good instances uh, here, uh, which um, are uh, examples that test my, uh, my propositions here. Um, but I suggest they're mostly extremities. I'm talking for the most part about mainstream stuff rather than about these particular examples. So mechanical performance in, in these sorts of challenging circumstances is, is a good thing. Uh, that's, that's progress for humankind. Um, but there's a bit more to the story than that because intelligence, when we talk about it uh, in the large, is about more than just that front end stuff in those definitions of AI. Um, because the formulation of goals has to have a reference point. Otherwise, we're not exercising uh, our intelligence as human beings. Um, and why we usually talk about it is that we must have a set of values uh, affecting how we formulate those goals. And we compete amongst one another and we try to negotiate in groups in order to um, get a feel for one another's um, um, trade-offs uh, between different values in order to achieve outcomes. Um, and if a, an artificial intelligence can't do that, how intelligent is it? Not enough intelligent by definition or not same as intelligent. Um, and similarly with these other things, I mean, common sense understanding has been a battle, battleground in AI for uh, many, many decades. Uh, but detecting changes in, in, in the environment, which are of relevance to what I, as an AI, do, is another test of intelligence. And can they do that? Did we build in enough assumptions? Did we know what the assumptions were we'd made in creating that AI in order for it to be able to say, ah, I detect that something out there is now different from what you assumed or told me to assume was the case. I don't know that we've got an awful lot of that building uh, to what we've got out there. And I'm not sure how we do it. This is really hard. Certainly the value stuff is essentially, uh, many of us would think impossible uh, to build into uh, in artifactual terms. And as for the learning, learning is not just, um, oh, I bumped into that wall three times. Maybe it's a wall that stays there. Uh, it's learning is a lot more than that. And uh, the, the deeper layers of, the, of learning ongoing adaptation um, are, are crucial in, in higher order intelligence. So there's quite a lot of areas of concern about these, the notion of artificial intelligence already. Now, clearly I have to move at speed through the line of argument. Now I want to move on to the argument of, or the aspect of, um, there are nasty things, dangerous things uh, involved in um, artificial intelligence as it is practiced. And we can start out with the fictional ideas because those fictional ideas arrived long before the AI did. Uh, and they're very important ideas. So the machine stops 1910 uh, and it's the original um, autonomous machine question. We no longer know how the machine works. If it stops, what do we do? We don't know, we sort of know what comes out of the end of it. Uh, we don't know how it works and we don't know what to do if it isn't working. Uh, so um, a fairly short, uh, fairly short story, but an important one. Uh, you are the uh, Rossum's universal robots, the origins of the word ro robot, robota, worker in Czech. And Karol Czapek invented the word so he could write a play. I mean, it was a play about robots uh, becoming more and more powerful and taking over the, uh, taking over the world and removing the humans. Uh, it's the, the, origi the original ap apocalyptic approach in 1923, but uh, that's the origins of the word and we use it now. So we uh, should be aware of our history. The original Android um, 1965 um, uh, sci-fi, uh, John Bonner's 1975 described the internet before actually the word existed. Um, he didn't use the word internet, but he described it. He was a chemist 
biochemist, a brilliant uh, sci-fi uh, author, and he also invented the word worm. Um, I had to do a fair bit of research, but Klaus Brunner in Hamburg assured me that absolutely no one has ever found any use of the word worm before that book, and he describes quite precisely a worm, long before the first one was implemented. William Gibson invented the word cyberspace in 1985, and the 1986 book um, uh, uh, covers it. He also has a network enabled AI, and it is an AI um, in, in that sense um, uh, that, is, that is in the network. Well, more than one. Um, part of the problem is which ones are the AIs and which ones are the people um, that are operating over the network. And, uh, and it's become really complicated since then. I mean, that's 1995. The whole cyberpunk literature became very, very complicated. I did, I did manage to come up with a five-word description of what, uh, of what, um, uh, what Stevenson does in the Diamond Age. Um, it's nanotech, but it's also networks with AI impregnated. It's ubiquitous and it's very confusing. <laughs> Uh, trying to work out your, your position as a human in, in that world. So it's all been done in those environments. Um, and what we have to do is bring it down to earth a bit. Now, if you look at the um, um, expressions of concern over the last five or 10 years by um, learned, retired, or various kinds of things, well, I want to be said to be fair, but um, uh, they all have made expressions of concern which make some degree of superficial sense, but they don't actually help us much when we're trying to understand what it is that's actually dangerous. So we're gonna move beyond that. Um, in the 2019 series, the, uh, one of the central things I had to do was to clarify for myself and for other people, um, what, what are the clusters of things that concern the public and that should concern the public, should concern policymakers, and should concern corporate strategists partly because they might need to be on top of these things themselves, but also because backlash from the public and from policymakers may well uh, damage a lot of their plans and uh, destroy their return on investment. Um, and the five that I came up with are here, I'll work quickly through them. Artifact autonomy um, is, is obviously a critical issue, extremely poorly understood. Um, I had to build a diagram out of, or a table out of literature because there wasn't the table around that enabled me to talk sensibly about this. And you can't see that very well at that distance, I'm sorry. Um, there are, it's useful to distinguish um, six different levels of autonomy. And at, at one level, uh, all, the, um, all the autonomous artifact, not necessarily AI, but all the autonomous artifact is doing is doing some analysis, which is provided to individuals or organizations to enable them to further analyze as they see fit, decide and act. There is no decision and no action here. Uh, and increasing, pardon me, degrees of sophistication enable uh, advice about options to be drawn out uh, from this analysis and provided forward, and even outright recommendations provided forward. All of those are decision support mode. The presumption is there's a human or humans out there that will be taking advantage of what comes out of these autonomous activities here. Beyond that, at the extremity, a device acts, and thank heavens the Mars buggy does, uh, otherwise it'd be sitting there all the time waiting for its next, next, uh, next command. The, the feedback loop would, uh, would just take far too long. The scope or the role of the, of the human is at least during those 20 minutes on Mars, zero. No role whatsoever. And of course that can be more extended periods. The concept is, um, is infinitely applicable. There are a couple of uh, intermediate possibilities, which are still decision system uh, activities where the, um, uh, the software in the power station uh, acts and says, I've already taken this, but I'm telling you what it is I've done. Um, you have an opportunity to interrupt, suspend, cancel. Uh, you have to be quick. It's uh, is the typical uh, a typical context. Uh, same thing with fly by wire. Um, and there's the possibility also of notifying an impending act, giving notice in advance, saying, "In 11 seconds, I shall, or in an hour's time, I'm going to open those sluice gates because the that storm in the catchment is." a lot bigger and a lot closer than you thought it was going to be. You've got too much water in the dam, you're risking breaking the dam wall. I'm going to do it unless you override veto, um, uh, uh, it's going to happen. So there's various levels. And unless you separate those out and evaluate, do your risk assessments, taking into account those different layers, uh, we're in difficulties. 
Now apply that in the AI context. Have we been doing it? I see an awful lot of circumstances where I don't think anybody's even thought about those issues. We are sliding through, let's take robo-debt, not AI. Let's take robo-debt. It wasn't just a stupidity of income averaging. It was the automation of the inferencing, then of the decision-making, and then of the action based on that automated decision-making. That's what created the disaster. And nobody ever stood there and said, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, let's just have a look at this. Nobody did it. Um, that there's a whole story as to why that, to why they, uh, they never is, is there not a classification like this in the automated driving uh, space? And I, I think to insurance companies, particularly when you look at this question. Yes, yes, I should. I must admit, I haven't looked at that. I actually did this stuff back pre 19, so about 2016. Uh, so I should, I should go and have a look. There's been a lot more maturation since I was last looking. Yeah, thank you. Um, the second of, of the areas that um, uh, the second cluster is assumptions about data. There's a lot of circumstances in which the data that is being depended on uh, by whatever the AI technique is um, has weaknesses that are serious. One that's often overlooked is data selectivity. So often we depend on data that's already accessible to us. Convenience data is used not only by researchers, it's, it's used by, uh, by people in the real world. Um, and if you stand back and say, well, what we're really trying to decide in this, the factors are these, therefore the data we need is this, oh, damn, we're missing some of it. You then discover that the selectivity is a problem. You've at least got to have some proxies for the, for the things you're missing if you're going to do things reliably. That's so often overlooked. Interpolation of data, what do you do with missing data? Leave it as a blank? Oh, I wonder what the software does with that. Uh, oh, perhaps we better shove it in a, a mean. A mean of what? A mean of similar instances or a mean of the training set or a mean of the complete set or what do you mean? And on what basis did you choose one over the other? And so rarely is this really thought through clearly. Uh, people just say, oh, we'll have to do something about the missing data. <laughs> Not good enough. Incompatibility when data comes from different sources. Uh, the whole quality field uh, is, is, a, is a major problem. Uh, there are many, many ways to cut the data and information quality uh, area. Uh, but many of these, I believe, are not at all well handled in, in data analytics generally. Yeah. Um, uh, some of these barely even appear in uh, the main works on, on data quality. So the question about, are you actually associating the data with the right real-world entity or identity? Uh, have you actually got the right one? Um, are you associating that data or measure with the appropriate attribute, or are you actually managing uh, measuring something a bit different from what you think you're measuring, or uh, using a proxy without thinking about the extent to which that proxy is an effective one? And have you signified that is the value in the cell? Does it effectively represent the real world thing you're you're claiming that it represents, or assuming that it represents? Those are so often left out of data quality lists. So there's a lot of issues that arise with AI. And remember, all of these compound, each, each of these is a contributor to the difficulties that arise. Right. Uh, because the inferencing process makes some assumptions. Uh, certainly, it makes some assumptions about missing values. Um, in a lot of cases, you can't have them. And another assumption many of these techniques may, may assume is we assume the data is on a ratio scale. Well, there's a hell of a lot of data out there that isn't on a ratio scale or has been forced into a ratio scale. Liquid data, for example, is not on a ratio scale, but we assume it is because it's convenient that way and we can apply our wonderful statistics to it. Um, when I have asked data analytics master's course teachers in the past, it's going back a few years, um, I can't find in your textbooks bits of your chapters that say indicators and contraindicators for the use of this method. It's a set of chapters on methods, but but I should know when that method is and is not, crucially, is not applicable. I can't find them. Firstly, is there a general work, dear lecturer? And are there specific works on each of these things that you give to your master students? The usual response was, hmm, it is a bit of a gap, really. Have you got any recommendations for us? The hang on a tick. <laughs> I'm the outsider. I'm asking the questions. I'm, I'm not the expert. It is a real issue uh, in a lot of these, uh, a lot of these cases. As I say, these compound, add to that the opaqueness. Um, add to that the, that the fact that at law, 
very few of us have responsibilities here. Now, out of the sharp end, the final deliverer, user, applier of an AI technique may have some obligations, may be found liable at law. Working back up, let's take the simple idea that it's a supply chain uh, with a series of uh, uh, research scientists, IR&D, and so forth on the way through, there's very little that um, can arise in terms of legal consequences for each of the players along that supply chain. And that, to me, is a, an enormous weakness. I argued the case, would you believe, in the 80s about software suppliers. Software is not a product for the purposes of a product, what's the word I'm looking for, product liability law. Uh, uh, there was discussion in the 80s, and I submitted to that to Senate committee, but they never did anything, of course. Um, the only way that software has product liability assigned to it, and I've got to be careful here because I've got several lawyers in the audience, uh, is if that software is embedded in an artifact. And then the combination of the two is subject to product liability, or otherwise software isn't. Is that near enough? At the level I'm talking at, okay, near enough. Thank, thank you. <laughs> um, so, Kayleen and I have worked together, but she doesn't owe me anything, so she, gets, <laughs> she can say you're wrong. Uh, so, I use the word irresponsibility. There is a lack of responsibility through the chain. Compound all of those together. That's why the public gets concerned, and uh, to a considerable extent, with justification. Now, I've played around with this in the um, AIML space. Um, uh, clearly, I can't do a case study of each of the different kinds of AI um, in, in 40 minutes. These are the sorts of assumptions that I think are often to be found in AIML. I've not practiced in AIML. I have supervised a PhD in AIML, but, uh, but that only gives you a, a thin supervisor's uh, knowledge of these kinds of things. But the, the suitability of the training set and the scale of the training set in comparison, firstly with the real world, and secondly, with the available data, um, is an open question in a lot of cases. The quality of the data, the individual data items, to what extent is that, uh, has that been assumed rather than being inspected and dealt with? Um, uh, bias, um, now there's a tricky, a, a, a whole area of discussion in its own right, uh, but uh, the, the bias that exists in a great deal of AIML, um, I dislike the word algorithmic bias, um, because it's empirical bias for the most part. Um, the amount of bias that's in there is normally A, large, and B, difficult to discuss and difficult to analyze. It ain't that simple. You've actually got to dig in for a long time, and you can't understand bias unless you've got a good understanding of the real world that it's supposed to be applying to, or from, and or from which the data has been drawn. It's a really difficult thing to, to get right. So it's a safe thing for me to say that there are often assumptions uh, of this nature. So there's a lot of those things which results in a, a range of risk factors with AIML that need to be managed. Now, this is the kind of slide you put to corporates and say, yes, by all means, um, keep going with your experiments with AIML. But as they start looking as if they might have some payback for you and you might switch them on, some of them on and actually apply them, you've got to think about a few things. Um, what liabilities are you opening yourselves up to, partly legal, partly moral, partly corporate reputation, and so forth. And the sorts of things are the modelling. A lot of AIML is done substantially blind. Obviously, unsupervised machine learning is, is, is the extreme case, where you can't reasonably say that there is a model of the real world. Okay, there's an implicit model, because of whatever is in there, is presumed to be a reasonable representation of that real world. But on what basis can you argue that if you don't really understand what that model is? You've never made it explicit. Now, obviously, in extreme situations, they, they, do, they do exist. People have actually done their modeling first and they've actually got the appropriate data and appropriate data sets and quality data, which they then feed in. Um, so I'm, I'm not criticizing every instance. I'm saying it's a risk factor. If the CEO doesn't ask the question, are you sure about the modeling underlying this? How close it is uh, to, to the real world systems? If the CEO or the CEO's designate um, hasn't asked that question, there's an unmanaged risk in place. Um, the, it's quite often that the real world relationship is dubious. Convenience data has been used. Um, we've got too small a set of data. Uh, it's mainly about Eskimos. 
that's a biometrics uh, history one, if you, if you know that one. Um, actually, it wasn't mainly about Eskimos, but there was an inherent bias in the data towards particular uh, particular um, um, ethnic groups in the original um, biometrics collections used for testing, simply because it was the stuff that was available at the time. Obviously, felons would be a, a logical thing. Oh, we've got, we've got it for criminals, so let's use that data set. About 15 minutes to go if you want to Thank you. questions. Yes. Um, so um, uh, so uh, getting that relationship and understanding that relationship is important. And one of the things I do like to flog is we are depending on empirical data here. And that empirical data um, alone um, is ascientific and leads us to irrational outcomes. The whole history of science is about the appropriate interplay between theories, originally ad hoc ones, testing in the real world, and either correction of or or removal of and substitution of uh, assumptions, and then gradual refinements as theories got better and better, feedback loops between empirical work and theory work. The marriage of the two is crucial to science, and we're abandoning it because of the nature of AIML, and that's a risk. Now, clearly, I can't make that statement generically about every AIML project, but there is a big risk factor with AIML. Um, I shuffle those impacts and implications, but I'm not going to dwell on the various circumstances in which this matters. I'll, um, uh, we've dealt with that one. The, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just use those two. Uh, people get very upset when they've got an undefendable accusation. I'll go back to uh, Robert again. Uh, the relevant information wasn't provided to the people. They were just told, uh, tell us what you actually earn, show us the documents, uh, but we won't tell you what we're accusing you of. I'll use the bill. No explanation of how the bill was was uh, was uh, calculated. So that, which is a very easy outcome with many forms of AI, uh, because we have obscure algorithms or obscure not algorithms, as the case may be, uh, is a very concerning thing and gives rise to unaccountability, gives rise to um, undefensible accusations. But another one, predestination is one of those words I like to use because it sounds so wussy, it sounds so vague, it sounds... Uh, worse than humanities, this is uh, this is religion predestination. Well, what's predictive policing there? They actually call it that. Uh, it's uh, now okay. Quite often, predictive policing has got to do with precincts rather than individuals. But sometimes there is. I think I'm right in saying sometimes there is written on all of this stuff. Um, sometimes it is about individuals in predictive policing. So it's certainly about ethnic groups. So um, we've got um, some really big risks if. We're allowing our AI to, um, to blunder blindly with inadequate information and understanding into these areas. Um, now, my wrap up, which is quite a few slides at speed, is to say, well, that's all very fine and good, but um, that's shown that artificial intelligence is a dodgy notion. What should we be doing? So my line of rationale is this. The notion of artificial is a problem. It seems like we're trying to uh, at least simulate and probably substitute, et cetera. So let's get a different adjective. Artifactual has an advantage. It's a very similar word, but it draws attention to the hardware. Uh, and it's that which will work with the hardware. And intelligence we'll come back to in a moment as well. But what do we want from this? If we come up with something that's artifactual intelligence, um, why? If we've got 8 billion people in the world, um, maybe only 3.5 billion when, uh, when McCarthy started all this, but 8 billion now, why do we need more natural intelligence? Isn't there enough of it out there? Is there something that I'm misunderstanding here? Now, you probably can't read this for two reasons. You're too far away. But Frank and Ernest had computers, which, as you can see, are very old-fashioned images of computers, uh, looking over the mad scientist's shoulder, and they're saying he's working on a computer to mimic the human brain. They think that's progress. <laughs> now, I should have put this on a white or black background or something. This is yellowed with age. That's the original clipping from the newspaper in 1985. And uh, the cartoonists that worked it out in 1985, what was wrong with the AI scientists who didn't seem to have got the idea yet? So um, I think we made the mistake a long way back. We don't want that. Uh, what we're interested in is artifactual intelligence that does things well that we don't do well, and that will marry with our 
way of thinking about things in such a way that we can actually do better together. Um, obviously, the interfacing needs to be with other software as well as with wetware. Um, but they are the sorts of things we want, surely, isn't it? And that's not what artificial intelligence describes. Let's very quickly uh, look at ChatGPT as an example. And the nonsense that's gone on with ChatGPT, and I, want to I don't want to suggest there's no value um, in LLMs. What I'm suggesting is there's some really major problems with how these things are being conceived. Because the recrimination started straight away, and there's all sorts of examples there. Uh, the ARC assessors uh, submitting uh, data reports, uh, which, uh, which one I particularly liked uh, for this audience, because uh, it's been used by ARC assessors when it shouldn't have been. Um, but then came this one. This was while I was uh, doing the previous presentation in uh, July on the, the related, closely related to this one. And the, the advice um, within government to public servants around the public service was don't use ChatGBT to make decisions, write code, or prepare tenders. So uh, now, just today, there's a headline in Innovation Australia, um, which repeats and extends this advice. Um, now, what's the problem underlying this? The problem underlying this is that ChatGPT has been set up as though it was a decision system, as though it was going to deliver the goods. No, it should have been set up as uh, conceived from the beginning as a decision support tool. The students should have known from the beginning that there was going to be a watermark. Maybe that's not going to solve the problem, but that kind of thing. Um, the students should have known from the beginning that they would be interspersed within the text sentences saying, this has been generated by a computer and you should not use it uh, without first checking its usefulness. Uh, those things turn up, things like that. Uh, turn up and the students don't notice because they don't actually read what the computer has produced. Um, so, well, actually, those little bits are decision support tools, aren't they? They have actually been usefully designed if they will spit out those warnings. That's what we need. We needed that built in from the beginning with ChatGPT. So that's just an example of the, of the way in which we can get caught out. Okay, so what am I proposing we should be talking about? We've got human intelligence. We'd like to augment it. And we're going to worry ourselves about what's here. Now, augmented intelligence is not something that I came up with as some brilliant insight. Augmented intelligence, of course, goes back a long, long way. The word augmentation certainly goes back to Engelbart of mouse fame. Uh, 1962 uh, is, is his publication on this, uh, but it, it's predated by other words, but uh, very closely related concepts. And it moves on through a whole pile of zigzag um, uh, as an idea uh, through the last decades. And there's some good stuff in there. IEEE's had several goes at this area. They've buggered up several of them. But, but this one, um, which hasn't actually got very far, um, is uh, they use the word extended, which is fine, uh, because they're using it in, uh, in ways that are, that are relevant to what we're talking about. So the notion of augmented intelligence is around. And what is it that we would want to have um, to fill this gap? And maybe some of the tools that we call AI might fit the bill, we might need to reconceive them a bit, but the reconception is critical because we don't want them as artificial intelligence. Firstly, let's uh, change one of those words. Let's put artifactual in there instead of artificial because that changes the angle straight away. Let's then go further. I'm going to have to remember to press my, press my button ahead here. Uh, let's get rid of the word intelligence. We need something, software doesn't cut the mustard. Um, so intellectics is available. Uh, I've done lots of searches on intellectics, and there's almost nothing in the literature apart from my paper. Uh, but um, uh, it's vague enough, um, and it's in the general space, and it can be put within artifactual and qualified. And now we know we're talking about what the software does in an artifact. It's that kind of thing we're trying to convey. So we want to combine those two things. We've shifted the emphasis. And crucially, absolutely crucially, there's a characteristic of what we really want, which is that it be complementary. Complementary to the human intelligence. So go back over all those, um, all those differences we don't want to replicate the 8 billion humans that we've got. The, uh, a couple of further aspects to this are that um, we have got this old saw in engineering or defense or what have you, much used in drones and so forth, should have been used for that escapes going down to look at the uh, at the, uh, the sunken ship. Um, but there's more to it than just dull, dirty, and dangerous. 
Uh, there's a PS to it, because we want what the PS stands for. The other things that are so often left out of these discussions are precision and speed, uh, fly by wire and so on. Um, the, the ability to make decisions quickly enough and the ability to do the calculations both accurately enough and quickly um, are crucial things which complement humans. So there's a bunch of things that are complementary, many of which we've already delegated. We've got lots and lots of low level stuff. I drive a now a relatively modern 2008 vehicle, but the one I'm still trying to sell is a 1994. Uh, it's a BMW M3, so it was a good vehicle of its era. A bit too hard on my spine these days. Um, and it already had in 1994 multiple layers between me and the machine. Nothing like as intrusive as, as those horrible modern cars, but uh, uh, but ABS is a very very good thing. Totally happy to delegate that one. Um, I cannot possibly perform as well. So. Is that the whole story? No, it's not. Obviously, we have the ability to uh, act as humans. We've been building actuator-based um, um, things that act in the world for a long time. And if we combine them together, um, then we get something, let's call it capability. Would you believe that was the single hardest image to find in this entire set? There are so few good photographs of humans working with robots. It's beginning to arise out of the co-robotics, uh, sorry, cobotics movement, but it's it's it, they're still hard to find. So we want to do those sorts of things, and um, what that then means is um, this is almost the end of it. I'm really believed to say that we're combining these things together to give an action capability, and therefore we're we're, we're satisfying the fourth part of the definition um, uh, in the AI area. And the end result of all of that is that human intelligence with its effectors already results in human action capability. We've got complementary artifactual intellects combining with actuators to give complementary artifactual capabilities rather than intended to be independent capabilities. I'm not talking quite so much about uh, Mars buggies. I'm not talking so much about uh, things in far flung galaxies that we send out there. I'm talking about the vast majority of things that we're going to do with old AI um, and with artifacts. And that then gives us augmented action capability, which is where we really ought to be trying to head. So, my argument is that we have um, a means to achieve the end of augmentation. We can then lead on to various kinds of discussions about. Well, where does robotics fit into this? Has robotics already got there? And the answer is no, because it's too specialised. But at least it's very much in the um, in the directions that I've been talking about. Um, when IEEE talks about AI-based autonomous systems, where do they fit on that chart? I don't fit where they should, but but it's a it's a discussion we're worth having. And if we can redirect uh, that particular movement in IEEE, we'll get somewhere. Uh, so I think that this approach passes the basic tests of having looked at what's wrong with AI and said, what things do we change? What words, what conceptions do we change in order to end up with a better place and, uh, and better prospects of delivering value and doing less harm? Thank you very much.